Well, let me first of all thank you all for coming, and I, um, um, you know, I'm talking to a very, very knowledgeable audience here. So uh, this is uh, slightly intimidating because you, a lot of you folks, know more than I do. So uh, I'm not sure how uh, much I can add, but I'll do the best I can. First, let me say that um, I'm. I want to explain why I, I wrote this. And I say I because I began writing it before I. Uh, before Jerry came in as co-author, and thank God he did. It helped the book immeasurably. But the initial motivation was mine. And I found life in the legislature so fascinating um, that I, it seemed to me that one ought to be able to write a reasonably interesting book about it. There, there have been some interesting books written about legislative life, but quite a bit of the writing about legislative life is not interesting. And often students, in particular, are exposed to the less interesting versions, um, which turns them off. And I think, that's not, that's not right. I mean, I, we had these big fights and arguments and a lot of passion and excitement and drama. Was, that ought to be presented so people maybe can be attracted. And, and actually, that was sort of my secondary goal, because I don't, I, I wanted to correct the notion that not only is it boring, which it isn't, but also that you can't accomplish anything. Three men in a room, that sort of thing. I mean, that's it's simply not true. Um, our, our book talks about instances in which we went against the leadership of, of, of my own house and won. And that's possible. And it's still possible. But not only does the public not know that, I think maybe a lot of legislators have forgotten it because it's, it's not attempted very often anymore. But it can be done. We also wanted to remind people that the New York State Legislature 30 years ago was, in, in fact, a, a, as the, our producer told, you know, mentioned, um, considered one of the top premier professional legislatures in the country, model legislature. And so if it was at that level in the past, there, there should, there's no inherent, no intrinsic reason why it couldn't be again. I'm not saying it would be easy to get back there, but it's, it's certainly not impossible. Uh, it's not, there's nothing about the institution, and in fact, beyond that, I think we, we, we're both in the habit of saying if you give up on the legislature, you give up on democracy. That's not really a, an attractive option. So we must try to, to bring it back to a, to a, a, a level of, of, of fine function. And, in, and so, so I, we're, we're try, I, I hope that the book would encourage people to respond if they think that their own legislator is a disaster. So run. You know, run against the legislator. It's not impossible to win in a legislative district. And um, <laughs> we did see, uh, well, at least one result of the primaries recently that I consider gratifying. But there weren't enough primaries. There should have been a lot more. I mean, for all the, the, the negative things that people are saying and hearing and feeling about the legislature, there should be more people running, and maybe, I mean, of course, the problem is the book only came out September 1st. You know, give it a, give it a few more months, and we'd have more people running. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Okay. But, but that was, I, I guess, the motivation. Um, uh, you know, I am proud of having been a member of the legislature, and there are people who are very puzzled by the fact that I'm proud of that. Um, if we can restore the legislature to the, the heights that it was at that time, then um, I think people will understand better why I'm proud in that regard. Speaking from my own house, I, that is the assembly, which I know somewhat better than the Senate, um, I would say that when I came in, in 1981, I was elected in 1980, the Democrats still very much felt the, uh, the pent up frustration that they had in all those years in the minority, which didn't end until 74, where they really wanted to get things done and couldn't because they were in the minority. Uh, they, were, they had notions of economic justice, social justice, racial justice, and so forth, and they really wanted to do those things. And that was the overriding passion. And although the speaker initially was Stanley Steingut, who had been the minority leader and so more or less automatically became speaker, at their first opportunity to elect new leadership, they elected a fellow, Stanley Fink, who was very passionate in this regard and really did want to get a lot of stuff done. And I'm not, by the way, I, I'm under no, uh, Stanley Fink was a, uh, was a real politician. 
he was unlike myself, he never claimed to be a reformer. He was a, very much a regular organization politician. And uh, I'm well aware that there were plenty of deals cut and the normal political wheeling and dealing. But along with that went the passion for social justice and, a, and, a, and a, a commitment to trying to enact legislation that would advance social justice. Almost inevitably, and I'm, <coughs> this is not, I mean, it may sound like blame, but it's really not blame because it's probably a human, an inevitable human condition. As the Democrats held the majority for a very long period of time, so I guess they did some of the things they initially came in to do, but, but some of that passion dissipated. And uh, the balance of priorities shifted more toward protecting the majority, protecting the perks, protecting the power, protecting the privilege. Clearly, they still trying to do things, but it wasn't as high a priority. And the nature of the leadership changed. I was just, uh, I guess, talking to Lisa about this, that, that uh, when under Fink's leadership, you had quite, uh, quite consciously, Fink, the highest ranking people in the conference included everybody from, from Frank Barbaro to Roger Roback, who were in one case far to the left, in the other case far to the right of, of Stanley Fink, and their disagreements were open and public, and Democratic conferences in, in, in the caucuses, when we, would, when we would caucus as Democratic conference, the debates were furious, ferocious, and, and it was intended, they were intended to be. Uh, and it was a, 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 an adversarial but creative process. And in recent years, committee chairs don't speak publicly unless they've cleared it with the speaker, unless they know that the speaker approves. And the people who get promoted are people who agree with the speaker, or at least don't publicly disagree. And I don't even know how much private disagreement there is. It's a different kind of institution. And those changes are not for the better, to my mind. But they can be reversed. People often is, people are more conscious of the power they don't have than the power they do have. And that's true of legislators and it's true of the public. And it, again, it's somewhat inevitable because you're, you're, con you're, you're conscious of where you're hitting up against the barrier. You're conscious of the frustrations. You're not always conscious of the power you have. A uh, philosophy professor of mine in college reminded me of this when he fought the IRS on something as a private citizen. And he said, I was right. I thought, you know, most people were afraid of it. He did. Well, Legislators today may have forgotten, may not realize that the, the speaker serves at their pleasure, the speaker is not their boss, they're elected by their constituencies, and that's, that's, that's their only boss. And if they want to fight, they can. And if they fight hard enough, they can win. Now, one, there are people who have pointed out that I paid a bit of a price for that. When I ran for higher office, I certainly got no support whatsoever uh, from the speaker in, in, or from the leadership in 1998. But, the, the, what was much more than worth that price was the fact that I did what I thought was right when I was a legislator. Um, and it was immensely gratifying. I still feel very good about it. That's a really long introduction. I'm going to stop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to stay.